It is such a pleasure to be with you here as part of this Alia Information Online event on digital preservation. I would like to firstly acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where I am living and working, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respect to their elders past and present. This panel today that we're bringing to you will be sharing some learnings and some practical advice for getting started with digital preservation and also for continuing to grow your capabilities in this field. We all come from a different variety of mid-sized institutions encompassing national libraries, national archives and university libraries, archives and records who are all tackling this challenge of digital preservation. So introducing our panel today, we have Andrea Gothels, who oversees the National Library of New Zealand's Digital Preservation Hi, Program and manages the team responsible for operating the National Digital Heritage Archive. Carrie Garvey works in the Digital Archives Innovation and Research Team at the National Archives of Australia. Libor Tsufal, is responsible for coordinating the digital preservation activities across the National Library of Australia to deliver their digital preservation strategic plan, preparing policies, implementing systems, tools and workflows, as well as operational management of the digital preservation team and system there. Alexis Tyndall is Manager Digital Innovation at the University of Adelaide Library in this role, Alexis is leading the development and the implementation of a digital preservation strategy and roadmap for the library, which encompasses the university archives, records, and special collections. And I'm Jay Weatherburn. I'm facilitating this panel today. I have two work roles at the moment. I've been working for the International Digital Preservation Coalition since early 2020 delivering the DPC program in our region and exploring the setup of sustainable operations for the DPC in Australasia. And I've been based at the University of Melbourne for just over five years now, where I'm leading the implementation of a 10-year strategy for long-term digital preservation. That's us. So for this session, we're going to go over a brief definition of digital preservation we're going to highlight a couple of useful tools for getting started before launching into presentations from each of our panel members about digital preservation work in their organisations. And then we'll move into some question and discussion time after that. So firstly, there are a lot of different understandings of what digital preservation is and what it does. So to just get us on the same page for this discussion today, we see digital preservation as the series of managed activities necessary to ensure continued access to digital materials for as long as necessary. The key point here is that we're just going to reiterate digital preservation is not an event that you do once. It is a series of ongoing things for as long as necessary. And to manage these ongoing things, you know, we need to have clear goals that sit within a policy and a management environment. It's not enough just to have the data that you want to preserve and use over time. Digital preservation is so much more uh, than just storage or backup on its own. Continued meaningful access depends on the context of use of your digital collections and the preservation actions that you put in place to respond to that use over time in an ongoing way. So we know we know, we all know with analog materials, the preservation and the conservation challenges, they're well known. Our responses are really well developed. Even if they're not funded well, they're well developed. Um, also, we often understand the value of analog collections, paper collections, for example. We understand the financial value as well as the legal or the cultural importance of those materials. With digital materials, we know you can't touch them. You need technology to interpret them. There's a variety of kinds of obsolescence for digital materials. Media as well as formats can become obsolete. But also, you know, we're often not as sure of the value of digital collections or the value of investing in people as stewards for those digital collections. 
as you know, both Monica and Nancy have said already today, we need new skills. We need new solutions to preserve digital materials, um, especially alongside our analog collections. Also, as Nancy said so eruditely earlier, it's almost like running two organizations at once when you're dealing with different requirements for analog and digital materials. We need new skills, not just for the technical requirements, but we need new skills that understand and can advocate for the value of digital collections and people to steward those collections. There is another challenge in that digitization and digital preservation are often conflated and it's not always helpful. If you work in digital preservation, you will likely find yourself repeating this over and over again in, in this line of work. You know, digitization is not digital preservation. We know that digitization is the process of creating a digital capture of something. We scan, we otherwise convert analog materials into digital files. Digital preservation is about preserving that digital capture. So assessing the risks to that material and putting in place the ongoing preservation monitoring and actions to mitigate those risks. And you know, that's true, whether it's because the material has been digitized, of course, or whether they're born digital. So the message is really, if you're digitizing, you need to be thinking about digital preservation strategies and planning for as long as you wanna use and access those materials over time. So to further illustrate all of the elements that go into planning for digital preservation, we thought it could be useful to kick off our panel discussion today with a couple of useful entry tools. The first one being this one, the Digital Preservation Coalition's Rapid Assessment Model. It's a bit of a mouthful. So we call it the RAM. It's easier to, it's easier to say. I am a I'm a particular fan of this model. I've used it over the last five years uh, with University of Melbourne digital preservation work. And I know our panel members have, have all come across this tool and may well speak on this further. The RAM is a maturity modeling tool. It's been designed as the name states to enable rapid benchmarking of where organizations are at with their digital preservation capability. This will help you ask questions like, where are we now with our digital preservation activities and where do we wanna go? How do we get there? It covers all of the things you should be thinking about and planning for in regards to long-term digital preservation. And it's broken down into organizational capabilities, which involves organizational viability to support long-term digital preservation, addressing the policy and the strategy environment, the legal basis, your IT capability, continuous improvement, the all important continuous improvement and community building, and also service capabilities. This is the real nitty gritty stuff. So acquiring, transferring and ingesting digital materials, both bitstream and content preservation elements, metadata management and discovery and access. The second useful tool we wanna to quickly highlight is the National Digital Stewardship Alliance or NDSA Levels of Digital Preservation, which focuses on the technology elements of digital preservation in particular. Again, this tool is easy to pick up and use. The levels cover functional technology areas such as storage, integrity, control, metadata and content. And each of these areas are detailed from a level one to a level four. Level one being the baseline of knowing your content all the way through to level four, which is being able to sustain your content over long periods of time. It is really well worth taking a look at this to you know, start assessing what gaps you may have in your long-term digital preservation technical capability and to help you plan to address those gaps. I think that's more than enough for me. I am going to throw over to our wonderful panel now to each share an overview of digital preservation at their various organizations and just some of the key lessons that they've learned through their work. So firstly, I am going to throw over to Andrea Goethals from the National Library of New Zealand. Hello everyone, thanks Jay. 
I'm going to share with you the journey of digital preservation at the National Library of New Zealand. Um, I want to acknowledge that most of the work I'm going to talk about here was done by my colleagues because I didn't join the, the library until late 2017. This is also a very high level um, and kind of simplified history of, of digital preservation at the library. Um, I left a lot of details out because what I wanted to do was highlight those things that looking back um, in hindsight were the things that actually made digital preservation possible at the National Library of New Zealand. So we begin the tour um, in 2003 when the National Library Act was revised it provided the library with the legislative mandate to collect and preserve digital content, ensuring that both current and future access to New Zealand's documentary heritage. It mandated the library to include digital preservation as a core component of the library's business activities. And it also enabled the library to start its search for a digital preservation solution. That led to, um, in 2004, that the New Zealand government provided the funds for a four-year project to establish what became known as the National Digital Heritage Archive at the library. This was a very comprehensive project because it focused not only on the, the technical solution, but also the organizational issues. So um, at the time, there, was, there wasn't a suitable digital preservation software solution available. There's a lot more solutions now. So what, what happened was the library spent a lot of time developing requirements for what a digital preservation solution could look like and got a lot of help from international peer review. And this ultimately led to Ex Libris developing the Rosetta software. That's um, the National Library of New Zealand is one of the, the users of this software. The library, another component of this project was working with Sun Microsystems who helped the library put into place the hardware that was needed for the first version of the NDHA. And the third part of the project, which I think is probably the most important, looking back in hindsight, was ensuring that the library was organizationally ready for a digital preservation program. So it included a lot of different things. It included establishing the policies and strategies that we needed, looking at staff capability, you know, was there existing staff who could do this work? Did we need new positions? What would those be? Um, but also integrating with existing library workflows and systems like the library CMSs. It was a business change process um, to make digital preservation an integral part of the library's operations rather than a separate parallel activity. Following that four-year project, the NDHA was put into production in 2008 and has been operational and growing as you see in this, this content chart here ever since. Um, so we now have 634 terabytes per copy. And I wanted to highlight that in down at the bottom of that graph, you'll see um, in 2012, Archives New Zealand started sharing the same solution with us. So that was an important part of the development of preservation at the library was that we, we collaborate very closely with Archives New Zealand and share the, the, the same backend preservation solution for what they call the government digital archive for their records. The library has a core digital preservation team of 10 people who are responsible for managing the NDHA, but there are also staff across the library who contribute to this effort. There's also a small team of dedicated digital preservation staff at Archives New Zealand, who we work closely with. Jay, do you wanna to move to the next slide? So each of us are gonna um, share with you a couple lessons that we've learned over the years. And the, the ones that I thought of was um, the first one, and Jay already talked some about this when she talked about the definition of digital preservation is that it's an ongoing process. It's not something you can just purchase or, or just check off and say, I'm done. My content is now digitally preserved. It needs ongoing attention, similar to the other high maintenance things in your life that you can think of, maybe a pet or your house. Once you have something in place, it becomes a matter of maintaining it over time. So it might be that you need to revise a policy 
or you need to move to a different um, modern storage solution, or you need to train new staff. Um, that's why I think um, it's very, very important to have institutional commitment to digital preservation because you, ne you need to be able to get through those, those lean times because you can't just stop and start. It needs to be an ongoing effort. And the other thing that I um, thought of as something that's very important for digital preservation is the importance of documentation. And I've, this has become more and more important to me over time, I think. Because um, what I think of it as kind of a bridge between the different stewards of your digital content over time. Because um, if you have key information that only one person in your organization understands or knows, it's, that's a very big risk because everyone within your organization will eventually move on to different roles or retire. So you need to make sure that um, those, those key things about your digital preservation program and content are documented so that you can pass it on to the next generation of stewards. Brilliant, thanks, Andrea. Next, we're gonna throw over to Carrie from the National Archives of Australia. Uh, thanks, Andrea and Jay, and <laughs> I'm going to uh, give you a brief overview. Like Andrea, I only started with the digital archiving section in 2017. Uh, so this is going to be talking a bit about what happened um, from the very start of our project back in 2001. And uh, we'll highlight the fact that we've actually had a bit of a stop-start journey, which is where some of those lessons learned reflect some of the things that Andrew was uh, talking about there as well. So prior to 2001, uh, the National Archives actually used what we refer to as distributed custody, which is we left the digital records with the agencies and it made them responsible for managing digital preservation. And then with funding in 2001, we started up the uh, digital preservation project. It was a small team of six people uh, and we pretty much developed an in-house solution because there was nothing out there at the time. And that took us a good seven years to do. So by 2008, that solution went into full production. Between 2008 and 2014, we attempted to transition to business as usual, but that really looked at more digital transfers um, themselves, that part of the process. And was probably more heavily focused on description uh, than anything else. And in 2014, the digital preservation team was effectively dissolved. Uh, between 2014 and 2016, the organisation um, had a bit of a change of direction and refocused for looking for a proof of concept for an end-to-end -end system to support our digital continuity policy 2020. Uh, which actually mandated that by 2020, all federal government agencies' records would have to be created born digital. So we were attempting to prepare for that. However, we abandoned that project in 2017, around 2017, and that's when uh, the team that I um, joined uh, first started. And essentially what we realised was that we still had a very aging digital preservation in-house platform, it's 20 years old now, and the records within it were going to be in the open period. So we had to provide access for those records. And we had done really no development of that system for a good 10 years or more. So we did a uh, audit using the ISO standard of our digital repositories. And that included like uh, Jay referred to with the RAM, the you know, entire organizational viability. So we weren't look, looking just at uh, this particular digital preservation system. We were looking at a, a separate digital asset management system we had for audiovisual. Uh, we were looking at how we were managing our digital surrogates and we were looking at our organizational capability at various other levels as well. And as a result of that, we formed the Digital Archives Task Force, which uh, went out for a tender for an external solution for what we refer to as the integrate, integrated archival management system. And the intention was to replace both our archival cataloging system and our digital preservation system. And we also focused on uh, capabilities, policy updates, and in my case, our archival control model and updating that. And in 2020, 
20 that um, task force was dissolved and we have purchased a commercial digital preservation system and we've handed that over to our IT section who's now uh, implementing it and uh, working on upgrades to the existing cataloging system and other systems in house and I've uh, the remainder of the digital archives task force in, in between 27 and 2020 that team was about 20 people uh, there's now five of us left and we're focusing on uh, digital capability still and uh, we have a research framework and plan which is you know doing more technology watch monitoring and then working out solutions for our business areas for their particular issues and currently that is uh, access and description uh, prior to that we've been looking at emulation and, and database preservation uh, so next slide thanks jay so um, as Andrew uh, noted, and as what I've been trying to describe there, you, it is really not, you can't afford to let it be a stop start uh, process, essentially. Uh, this is what happened to us. We put the records into a digital preservation system. We thought that was fine, but we didn't do any development on that digital preservation system. We weren't continually thinking about access and description and also what records we should be preserving. So we only had a digital preservation system for our born digital records. We weren't actually uh, putting our, the outputs of our digitize, digitization projects into there. And we had quite a lot of outputs. Current moment, we think we have about uh, 128 million digital images that uh, are slowly being ingested into the new system. So, you know, that was one of those critical things we, by the time 20 years down the track, we realised that we really need to do a quite a leap forward. Um, one of the things that I often think of as well is coming from paper preservation background and because it often seems, as we say, quite scare, scary or overwhelming, the, the extent of what needs to be done. But um, what I keep reminding myself is a lot of the key preservation principles still apply. It's just the approach and technology that's a little different. And you just need to wrap your head around that um, and move forward and really just, just keep moving, <laughs> just keep trying. And um, the last sort of lesson learned for me is that there isn't a simple solution. Nobody has all the answers, but the community is willing to share. So reach out and ask. That's it for me. Thanks, Joe. Brilliant. Thank you, Kerry. Libor, you're up. Libor from the National Library of Australia. Well, <clears throat> hello. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. I'm not going to talk about what we've done or what we are doing because I don't think it will be necessarily relevant for you. Our preservation journey has been quite similar to the National Library of New Zealand and National Archives. Um, but I don't think it's gonna be necessarily relevant for you and I don't want to overwhelm you. I will instead focus on some key lessons learned and takeaways uh, from our experience that will hopefully help you to get uh, started in digital preservation and also avoid some of the mistakes that we've made. Um, before um, I begin, I would actually like to make a little detour and talk about a story which seemingly has nothing to do with digital preservation. So where I grew up, uh, kids and even some adults like to make snowmen in winter. Um, the bigger, the better. Uh, if you want to build a, a snowman, you need to do some basic planning. So you need to decide where you want um, you know, it to stand, um, what the basic design of it's gonna be, you know, the, uh, the main choices are either two snowballs, three snowballs, will it have a head or no head, arms, no arms, um, will you have a, a, a nose made from carrot or from a stick or a coal, um, uh, probably not as uh, common nowadays, but nothing overly complicated. And once you made uh, these basic decisions, you just move in and you start building your snowman. Um, so you first make a, a, a snowball uh, about the size of your fist, and then you basically start rolling it on the ground. And so this, the snow on the ground, as you roll it there, starts sticking to the ball. And soon the ball starts to grow and, and becomes bigger and bigger. Um, it's very simple. 
And uh, every school kid should be able to, um, to do that without any help, basically. Uh, the beauty is that they can start on their own, uh, but usually when other kids see that you know they're building a snowman, they will come and try and want to join in because it's so much fun. And together they can build a much bigger one. So uh, you're probably wondering why I'm telling you that. Uh, um, I'm doing that because I think there is a lot to actually learn from that and apply to digital preservation. Uh, so um, I think that you know when it comes to digital preservation, um, we basically all now accept and acknowledge that it's important. I don't think, uh, and, and that it has to be done. I don't think there is uh, a lot of questions nowadays about that. Uh, but you know, we we um, talk a lot about what we should be doing. Um, some of us keep thinking about it and doing some planning, but when it comes to actually doing, you know, not so much. Um, and I often actually hear people, you know, talking to us about reasons or um, explaining why they actually can't do things. And it may be because, you know, they don't have uh, all the resources that are required or all the time. Um, they don't have all the policies in place or the procedures. Uh, they don't have, you know, the necessary skills, um, or they don't have a storage, or they don't have uh, a digital preservation system. Uh, the truth is, none of that is required. You can. There is a lot that can be done with your currently existing, even if uh, very limited resources. Um, and uh, I think what's really, really important is just start doing things. There is really no substitute for doing. If you want things done, get done, um, what you have to do is do them. You know, um, they will not get done otherwise. Um, so basically, um, my advice to you if you're starting in digital preservation is don't wait until all the stars align. Uh, you don't have to. Start right away. And in fact, when I say right away, I'd like to actually encourage or challenge everyone to basically, when you come to work tomorrow, uh, you know, commit to it and, and make some time tomorrow, you know, take one hour of your time. I, I'm pretty sure that everyone can spend one hour and start doing digital preservation right away. Uh, what you need to do is, you know, uh, yes, you need to do a little bit of thinking and planning, but don't overthink it. Just start doing things. Um, you need to start with small, you know, pragmatic, uh, manageable um, baby steps, and um, you will learn from that and take it further. Um, what you need to do is basically you take your existing um, digital preservation snowball um, or make one if you don't have it yet. Doesn't matter how big it's going to be and start rolling it on the ground, you know, uh, as soon as you start doing that or in a little while, stuff will stick to it and it will keep growing. Um, doesn't really matter where you start, um, doing something, anything is better than not doing anything at all. Um, so yeah, start building your snowman. Um, the, and and um, I call it, you know, um, adopt the Nike attitude, which is just do it. Um, so in addition to some people, you know, um, making snowmen, there are others um, that um, take it basically several levels up uh, and they like to make ice sculptures. Ice sculptures are these beautiful looking, impressive, elaborately carved uh, pieces of art um, carved out of blocks of ice, basically. And um, I'm sure that everyone can appreciate the difference between making a snowman and, and, and making an ice sculpture. So where, you know, every school kid uh, can uh, make an, um, a snowman um, in pro with minimal resources, probably in uh, about half an hour or, even, or possibly even less. When you want to make an ice sculpture, uh, it usually takes an artist with sophisticated and expensive tools uh, to carve an ice sculpture. It will often take several, several days to finish it and will be much, much more expensive. Uh, I think that in digital preservation, unfortunately, we are often trying to build ice sculptures. 
And uh, what is even worse, in my opinion, is that we expect that everyone else is also going to build our sculptures and we behave like it's the only basically way to do it. The consequences are that a lot of people get put off. Uh, they don't, don't have the resources, they don't have the time, tools, skills, or the artistic talent that's required. Uh, but digital preservation really doesn't have to be unnecessary, complicated, and complex. When it comes to it, it can pretty much boil down to you know, a few basic uh, steps and processes. Um, and um, the NF, um, NDSA um, levels of digital preservation that Jay mentioned at the beginning, um, I think that actually gives you exactly that um, you know, guidance on what you need to do. Um, so that might be actually a, a pretty good starting point. And the beauty of it is, as uh, Jay mentioned, that you have four levels basically there, st starting from very, very, you know, beginning novice level. Uh, and, and that's probably what you need to go for in the beginning. And then you build gradually on that. And maybe you get to level four, maybe you don't. And maybe sometimes you don't even have to get to level four. Um, so again, uh, my advice would basically be keep it simple. Do not let others to push or convince you to build ice sculpture where a simple snowman will do. My last um, advice or lesson um, uh, learned, um, I was not actually uh, able to nicely relate it to the snowman story. So apologies for that. Um, but it's basically about what you, what you need in terms of you know, uh, staffing and skills um, to do digital preservation. And I don't want to talk about uh, a people, but about personas. So in my opinion, what you need is three types of personas. You need a leader, um, an advocate, and a champion. And um, I need to make some points and clarifications. So um, basically you need at least one of each, but it can be more than one. Um, it can be the same person, or at least for some of, of, of them, uh, it can be the same person or it can be actually multiple different people. Um, and um, also when I say a leader, I actually mean someone who takes the responsibility for taking action and um, um, putting things you know, uh, in place and, and seeing them through and making things happen. That's how I define, define leader. Um, I think that advocate is pretty self-explanatory um, the good news is that you already have these two. Uh, it's basically you. You can take responsibility for starting and making things happen. Um, there's a really, really cool video that you can find on YouTube. It was also ma made into a net talk. Oh, sorry, TED talk. <laughs> um, I'm confusing it with our uh, National Library's um, National E-Deposit. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, it's uh, basically about lessons. It's a really interesting video about a guy dancing at a music festival. Um, I really, really uh, suggest you look it up uh, on YouTube. Just you know, enter uh, leadership dancing guy and, and you will find it. It will pop up right away. And uh, from that video, it draws, draws some really, really interesting conclusions about what it takes to be a leader and, and what you need to do. Um, when it comes to advocating, again, you can play that role. You know, you can start talking to people, educating them, making them aware about the risks of digital preservation, about why it's important, what it means, uh, what you are already doing, you know, talk to them, um, make them aware of these things. Um, champion, that's a slightly different category. And that's usually the trickiest uh, person to actually find. Um, it could be in a way you, um, 
especially if you know, depending on your position uh, at your institution and in, in the hierarchy, it often needs to be someone who is very, uh, inf or it should be someone who is very influential in the institution. And often it needs to be, and, and it means that it needs to be someone higher up in the hierarchy. Um, and it's basically, my definition is it's an advocate that's influential also. So, you know, that has a lot of influence in the institution and can actually uh, help you to get things done and, and, and bet for you basically in many ways. Um, I don't have any advice for you on how to find an advocate uh, or sorry, and a champion other than basically use every opportunity to find one. Uh, it can be tricky and difficult uh, it took us quite a while to find one. And in a way, it was actually a, a, a fluke. Um, we, it, it, we intended something else and it uh, kind of like turned into actually the person becoming our, our champion, really, really good one. Um, so yeah, that's basically my um, advice to you on what you need to do to, to start in digital preservation. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Libor. And I'm going to throw right over to Alexis from the University of Adelaide Library next. Thanks, Jay. And thanks, Libor. A bit of a typical act, difficult act to follow there. Um, so I'm just going to take you through a brief timeline of what has happened here. And actually, my timeline is a lot shorter than the things that uh, Andrea and Carrie have shared. Um, so in fact, I'm probably doing a massive disservice to the people who were advocates for digital preservation prior to 2016, because organisational commitments like this don't come out of nowhere. Um, our, our current uh, process and the truth that has resulted in the delivery of a digital preservation strategy and roadmap essentially started with a statement of intent in 2016 through a thing we call the Library of the Future Report. During 2015, the University Library, which in our case encompasses our archives, I think well, not at the time, but since then, encompasses archives, record keeping and special collections and art and heritage as well, um, reviewed their current services, feedback from their stakeholder communities, their position in the national and international library and university landscape, and looked at the next 20 years of the University of, of Adelaide Library, how they would approach the upcoming challenges and what would need to change within that one to three year period. Unsurprisingly, the increasingly digital nature of our services was a feature of that report in terms of collections, library structures, roles, staff capabilities, but digital preservation doesn't actually make an appearance. Um, it was with the operationalization, operationalizing sorry, um, of re the recommendations in that report around digitization, digital collections, discovery and accessibility, that a commitment to a digital preservation strategy was made. So in subsequent um, operational and strategic plans coming out in around 2019, a digital preservation strategy was rightly identified as a key component of the digital services we would need to service our users and our collections. Um, in the red there, talk turned into action in 2020, with the University of Adelaide Library announced as the 100th member of the Digital Preservation Coalition um, in March and my appointment in April. This brought resources to the effort of delivering on the digital pre uh, preservation strategy, hence the smile on your face there on my slide. Um, membership of the Digital Preservation Coalition indicated that we really recognised the value of community here. We're not cutting edge, we're not ahead of the rest of our sector, and we have the advantage of being able to learn from those who have carved a path ahead of us. The DPC stakeholder group, the case studies and publications that we've had access to, and our involvement in the informative Australasia Preserves community have proven invaluable in the steps we've taken since then. And they've accelerated our progress and helped us learn from the experience of our colleagues. Um, between April 2020 and June 2021, we developed our digital preservation strategy and roadmap, which was a process that involved a, a team uh, of representatives of teams across the library. To put this as one nice sort of straight line there would be very misleading. It's very important to acknowledge the missteps and the byways that we slipped down. One of the biggest ones was scope and scale. Discussions about where our responsibilities start and end, what we needed to preserve, became unwieldy. Gathering intelligence around business systems and data types we're managing became an unending process of investigation. Even with an organ a cross-organisational team that represented the different departments, ostensibly should, make, should represent all the systems we're managing. We found ourselves digging out spreadsheets created in years old audits, discovering systems that we were responsible for, but that we were barely aware of. Um, 
And we manage a mix of collections. The, some that have enduring value that we'll keep forever, some that have varying timelines for legal disposal, and some that sit somewhere in a grey area between the two. Um, collections that come into our custody, in most cases, originate in an environment that we have little control over, and so on. Um, systems that we thought were great and an easy place to start and low hanging fruit, uh, the rug got pulled out from under us because we found out we were due for an upgrade shortly and it was going to change everything. So this was our first key lesson that I'll refer to in a minute. When we tried to go from the data outwards, it would have been an endless process. The big step forward came when we benchmarked ourselves using the DPC rapid assessment model that Jay has flagged. This shifted the focus from the material we needed to preserve to the skills, resources and processes we needed to preserve it. And it was a real kick along in terms of progress. In 2021, lovely blue spot there, uh, the library leadership team endorsed our digital preservation strategy and roadmap. Um, these objectives specifically link the strategy with the organisational functions of the library, determining our initial focus and the limits of the activity. It flags the process of progressive and iterative interpretate, interpretation, uh, implementation and the sections of the roadmap, governance and policy, people and asset management respond to the elements of the DPC ramp. And every one of those strategic themes sets out the why, how, when, what, and who of delivery. Um, so the phases of the roadmap are undated, but set out a logical path for delivery. I've put a little meh face next to resources under that banner because as we all know, the events of 2020 have been unkind to the higher, higher education sector. And ongoing resource uncertainty means that we aren't rushing out and buying a preservation system. We are not going out and recruiting preservation staff, but a technology first solution would never have been the place for us to start anyway. So uh, next week, we'll actually see the first meeting of our cross-stream working group working on the implementation of this plan. Um, this group is taking up the DPC Novice to Know How training and we're starting on implementing phase one. So we have, while we are some way from a fully implemented preservation system, actions on staff skills and responsibilities, improved processes, understanding resources we already have and improving cooperation with our colleagues in ITDS will deliver significant improvements across the next phases. Um, you can go to the next slide, Jay. Um, so just really briefly, the lessons that we have learned. The biggest, hardest part for us was context and boundaries. And actually, Lee was just do it mentality it was really great. The relationship um, between scale and achievability, we just, you can become overwhelmed. I think every one of us in this panel so far has used the terms overwhelmed. Um, setting boundaries around what we can do and what we can do perhaps in the first day of phase, what we can do in the hour that you take tomorrow to do it is hard but necessary. Um, but at the same time, thinking big gave us a really neat opportunity for organisation-wide perspective and systems thinking. One of the reasons we got into the situation we are today where it looked too hard to start was that we had a proliferation of digital collections and systems that had sort of uh, built up around us in various, various places. And community resources, are invaluable. Um, looking forward for us, um, what can we do with limited resources? We are not likely to have a great deal of funding come into this situation in the near future, but what we do have is people. I am, I, digital preservation is not my only responsibility and none of the people in the working group is at their own responsibility either. But um, perhaps as Lee Ball says, we might be the little snowballs. Um, <laughs> start rolling around and having fun and people will join us and get on board with the situation. We will need to work collaboratively. Um, and I think um, there's gonna be an interesting challenge where because we have limited resources, we need to generate internal engagement on this process. So that can be perhaps sometimes more work than setting up and implementing a preservation system, but it may be more rewarding in the long term. Um, the just do it mentality, the start, you know, you start just with what you have control over is really, really good. Um, in our instance, one of the things about this preservation strategy and roadmap is that it gives us a bit of institutional authority. So it's a document, I haven't got a huge amount to report on implementation yet, but this is a huge step forward because when it comes to internal engagement, when it comes to getting the friends to come and help us build this snowball, that document is really, uh, really, really helpful. Um, so yes, and as already flagged, we might not have a fully implemented, implemented preservation system in the next six months, but we will have, we will come so far if we can improve across a range of fronts, skills, awareness, processes, even the way that we engage with our research community here at the university to help intervene at that point of creation as well. Um, so that's the, the couple of key lessons I wanted to emphasise today.
Fantastic. Thanks, Alexis. Thank you, everybody. I think those overviews and insights are so incredibly valuable to hear. And hopefully, you know, that's generated some thoughts and ideas for action to just do it for everybody listening. Possibly some questions, I hope, um, as this slide is flagging me to say. But before I stop sharing my screen and we move into discussion time, I will mention that we're very happy to share these slides we've put together with everyone. At the end here, we have some links and resources that we've talked about today, um, uh, you know, a whole bunch of things and a few extras actually. If you're interested in getting started with digital preservation or if you want to better connect with those doing this work in our region, there is a lot of strength in community in digital preservation and all of us are here today um, among many others around Australasia are actively building that community as we go through this, you know, this often very challenging but essential work that is digital preservation. So I will, well, let me stop sharing my screen here um, and get us into the discussion and question part. I think I will, I will get us started with this discussion time. Um, firstly, with a question, I want to focus on advocacy first up. A lot of you know, digital preservation practitioners I talk to, and I find this myself, you know, we often say so much time can be taken up with advocating and communicating about digital preservation. You know, Libor beautifully uh, showcased the leader, the advocate and the champion um, as essential players in this field. There's a wide range of stakeholders who need to be involved in digital preservation, you know, IT expertise, information management, knowledge from library, archives, records, fields of expertise, as well as, um, you know, as well as the knowledge of content creators themselves. So for the panel, you know, I want to know, how do you all go about advocacy in your work? Um, how do you go about advocacy in your work to, to get this thing off the ground? It's very hard to do. So maybe I'll go back in speaker order and I'll, I'll tap Andrea to get us started with the advocacy question. Um, I, I think my thought on that would be um, don't try to do it by yourself, that it's much easier to do um, as a group. Um, so something that I think about is who, who else in your organization um, is kind of a, um, a friend of digital preservation or thinks we should move in that direction. And then, you know, maybe you can um, organize something with them like the World Digital Preservation Day is coming up. So maybe plan an event for that and invite, you know, invite your, your organization to come check, you know, check it out and learn about it. Or um, um, there's a lot of digital events right now, a lot of, a lot of webinars. Um, so, or, you know, organize a, a meeting and invite people in to, to learn more about it. And so I think just um, taking advantage of events like that, um, to, to raise awareness about digital preservation is a good thing to do. Um, and then the only other thing I would say is, um, like, like you were saying earlier, Jay, to get involved with other groups. Um, what I've found, and I th think this is, this is true, is that if you can point to what other organizations are doing or you know, what your, a community document saying that this is important, that carries a lot of weight. So it might, it might be the same thing that you think yourself, but if you can point to, you know, every, you know, these people are doing this, they think it's important. This is, you know, a community accepted practice. It carries a lot of weight and it can really help you with your advocacy. I think, um... I should mention World Digital Preservation Day is the 4th of November uh, this year, folks, and we are with the Australasia Preserves Digital Preservation Community of Practice organising an event in that week. Uh, we encourage everyone to organise that as a key advocacy date to just get the ball rolling in your organisations. Um, so, Carrie, what do you think? Anything to add to the advocacy game? Yeah, I mean, I think Andrea touched on a lot of the things that I've been thinking about as well. I mean, a lot of the things we do is just communicate regularly um, just what we're doing and inviting people, uh, sharing sharing the work that we're doing, uh, inviting people to share the work that they're doing in this area that may not seem like it aligns, but it does. So we're asking our different sections to come along, you know, talk about what they're doing, uh, just constantly doing that sort of stuff. 
um, going back to, I was thinking, going back to the um, the RAM, like the the benchmarking we found and, you know, comparing yourself to doing the benchmarking and the maturity modelling, that sort of thing, we found really useful because of it really helped us identify all of our stakeholders, get them in the, in the room, have those discussions with them, highlight um, the issues with them and uh, hear, hear their point of view, express our point of view and, you know, come to some consensus in those areas. And, um, you know, and we sort of probably do that as well with uh, any, it's something else that I think we've all been talking about. It's just just do it, do it, do it in small bits. Just keep moving and doing that sort of thing. So that's the approach we do. We take what is the practical thing that we can actually achieve, um, and so we, you know, design um, some work around that, a project around that, and we make sure that we just get as diverse a stakeholder group as possible uh, on that project board as like a reference group to ensure that we're hearing everybody's voices and we're also sharing the digital preservation. What you know, what we're trying to do. Yeah. I think, um, Alexis, as you mentioned, you've got a whole, a whole board around this. You've got a strategic kind of leadership angle. Um, did you find that difficult to get that, that advocacy out there? Would you, would you do anything differently? No, I think actually um, I've, got a, I've sort of got three communities that I have to engage with. And internal engagement is actually quite good. Um, there's two sort of aspects to it. There is a community of archivists who um, sort of have a, panic and fear about the, the record-keeping responsibilities that we have and the number of digital systems we're working with and the challenges of that and I felt like uh, 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 have relief and are thankful that something is happening on this front. Um, there are the people who are traditionally librarians and bundling this activity together as our library has with my role in um, digital services and um, providing digital content kind of, um, I hate to say this, but like makes it a bit sexy, it's a bit exciting, it's a bit digital, it's a bit new, it's a bit cutting edge. And so that does help with um, bringing people on board on, on this journey. But like Kerry said, taking any opportunity to talk about it is um, is really useful. So we have internal did you know sessions to help cross team communication at the library. And I've put my hand up twice already to do that. Um, and so those sorts of things. Um, the hard part is um, in the university's environment, we have to work, we, we will have to work better with, on this with ITDS, our Information Technology and Digital Services. Um, we have a different focus. Their focus is on business continuity and our focus is on longevity of access. These are bigger professional differences than we sometimes realise and even things like language um, become difficult to, you know, to, we, we, talk, we talk different languages sometimes, use the same words for different things. Um, and so that's a really hard relationship that we have to work on. We do have an ITDS person on our working group, so that will aid with that communication and that priority setting. And I'm also making them do the Digital Preservation Coalition's Novice to Know How course, which should help as well with a big talk about this being shared, understanding, we're generating. Many of our content creators are the researchers and staff of the university. I can't influence them all, um, but what two two big notes we're hitting with them is one um, that uh, we have processes to help them meet their professional obligations. They have funding from federal government bodies like the Australian Research Council, National Health and Medical Research Council, um, and they have certain research data management responsibilities, and we can take care of that for you. You don't need to worry about that if you work with us. Um, and that also they're interested in their research legacy. And that's something that we have traditionally done for them through our special collections, our manuscripts and our archives. It's something we can work on. Um, but interestingly, we have had, sorry, I'm taking too long, but they, we have had a really big talk about our content creators and the fact of, about how much they really need to know about digital preservation. Because if all of our other systems are working well, if all of the material is funneling into the systems that we use to manage these things, they kind of don't even need to know the words digital preservation. In a perfect world, that would be happening. Um, but if it's an added motivator for them to use all of our public facing systems, then that's right, we hit that note as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, Libor, then to throw to you, um, you know, you already mentioned with champions using every opportunity you can to find them in the, in the organisation, even though there's no easy answers or ways to do that. Um, anything else you'd add on top of that in terms of advocacy? 
Oh, look, I absolutely agree with what uh, Kerry was saying. Showing is the best way. Now I'm back to where I where I started. It's difficult uh, to show what you do if you actually don't do anything. <laughs> so we learned that's it was actually coming, you know, from my heart because we learned that the hard way. Um, you know, we actually had a situation after several years into kind of like our digital preservation efforts where um, people started to say basically, uh, well, you've been talking about, you know, the importance and how critical it is, but we don't see any, any results. And um, they started, we started to lose them. They started to lose interest. Um, so it's definitely much easier, you know, if you do things, you, it will generate more engagement, it will generate more warm buying. You can talk about things that actually matter to people. That's what we do a lot, show and tell, not only kind of like, you know, formal presentations, but actually we organize regular meetings with our collection people to talk about particular issues, digital preservation issues in their collections. And, you know, we, we show and tell, explain what it means for them, let, ask them actually, you know, for input, let them make decisions. That's what generates, you know, the things. And it's also about long-term building of trusted relationships. Absolutely, seconded, seconded. I wonder now if I can bring in an audience question for everybody. Um, here we go. What are, what are the examples of a simple task to start doing digital preservation. And our questioner says, I am keen to build a snowman and not an ice sculpture. So Libor, maybe I'll put you on the spot first and then everyone else chip in yep. as you as you want. Yep, yep. Um, um, look, um, as I said, it doesn't matter that much, but having said that, um, there are some things w that are logical to basically start from. If, you know, if I wanted to be fu funny or nasty, I would say, you know, the best place to start is at the beginning, um, that, but that's not gonna be very uh, helpful. So uh, a good logical start for me is actually engage with your collection. You need to actually go deeper than just understanding of, you know, the high level kind of like what you have, how much you have, where it is, uh, what type of things. Um, I think if you don't, if you haven't, I think that most people probably have a pretty good idea about that already if you don't start there, but then you need to fairly soon move actually into deeper exploration. So my suggestion would be take a sample of, of you know, uh, one of your digital collections, something that's not overly complicated, but it's, you know, moder moderately challenging and start actually hands on exploring of what it is, you know, what formats you see there, how you would access it if you if you want it, can you actually access it, access it if you not, what would you have to do? And you will actually start really quickly, build a good understanding of your collection. And that will actually also help you to actually learn about digital preservation in general in context. And um, also basically, um, uh, you know, your decisions about how to do preservation of that collection actually is dependent on good understanding of, of what it actually is, you know, because different things need to be preserved in different ways. Um, so to me, that's a good thing that basically anyone can start really tomorrow. Any other thoughts? Carrie, Alexis, Sandra? Um, I have one that's uh, a thought that's um, an interesting motivator for us for what to start with. And um, I think, well, maybe start at the beginning, but this is um, a an interpretation at the beginning that we have an external factor that is getting people interested in digitization, which is that we receive donations from people. And so one of the things that we need to work on is workflows. We have a range of places that we're going to need to work on those workflows across the board. But actually this week I have had a meeting and an email which have spoken about people wanting to give us digital collections, um, generally personal archives or project archives, and the people who are receiving them because there's been that awareness reaching out and saying, what can we do differently? Like, what can we make sure we do in terms of updating our, our, our acquisition process so that we're starting to, starting to think about digital preservation in that process? Um, we had been thinking we were doing the right thing by bringing it in and sticking it on a shared drive but that's not going to be good enough anymore. And so that acquisition process is a good driver for those people who are going to need to change their work practices. We have a lot of work to do though, but that's one place, but something's going to be different. I would just add, um, just because it's hard to give 
concrete advice without knowing your exact context and, and your content. So I would encourage you to read. <laughs> there are so many good resources out there. Um, so on the slides, there, there was that whole list of resources, but that's just the tip of the iceberg, really. There is a wealth of resources out there. So if you go to some of the organizations that you, you know that um, you might think have large collections that they're preserving, they've probably got resources online for you as well. So there's just a lot to, to read. Um, and I would encourage you to do that. Last 20 seconds is yours, Carrie. Any final words? Yeah, thanks for putting me on the spot there. <laughs> <laughs> I would just affirm everything that everybody else has said, quite frankly. <laughs> That's it. Um, yeah, really, um, I like what Alexis was saying, because you can't discount the people who are actually depositing with you. And that's one of the mistakes we made as well. You really need to work with them. Um, so it's a good place to start, understanding them, understanding what they're depositing, understanding how you're going to have to actually manage it. Brilliant. I put you on the spot and you rose to the challenge. Thank you, everybody. Please uh, join me virtually, everyone, in thanking our panel today for their insights. Andrea Gerthals, Liba Tufal, Kerry Garvey and Alexis Tindall. You're all superstars and thank you so much for being here today. Um, I do believe we are now on a break until 3.15.